Welcome to the awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listing's photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. Welcome back to the Awesomers Podcast, everybody. This is episode number 18, and as always, you can find show notes and details available at awesomers.com backslash 18. That's awesomers.com slash 18. Now, this is a Book of the Week episode, and you'll find that we don't always space these out exactly seven days uh, in between episodes uh, based on schedules of guests and so forth. But our objective is to, to encourage you and to suggest that maybe reading a book a week is a good idea and internalizing those lessons uh, in some of those books and so that you can improve your own uh, you know, knowledge and potentially help your organization. And this week is about a very important book and something that it goes far beyond just a simple read as some of our books are great, simple, informative reads. This one is a powerhouse. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So today's book is called Strengths-Based Leadership. And this is a book that uh, has been instrumental in many of my organizations for lo these many years, probably well over, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Uh, I really don't know the exact count, but we definitely believe in the philosophy that is put forward by Strengths-Based Leadership and we're going to talk about what that philosophy is and why we think it's particularly important to pay attention to. One of the, the most important aspects of this is the fact that it's based on research. It's based on science. And, and what we know is that patterns and behaviors within human beings are consistent. Somebody who has a particular pattern of behavior, they found these, these uh, you know, consistencies along the way, and they're able to kind of help predict where somebody's strength is based on some of the things that they've seen over the course of time. It's a fascinating uh, situation. So this is not a horoscope where you go in and the fortune teller you know, pulls out some tarot cards or breaks out the crystal ball and, and tells, you the what, uh, tells you the 411, so to speak. This is real science, and it's backed by years and years, decades even, of research. So in recent years, uh, while, con- turning, uh, while continuing to learn more about strength, Gallup scientists have been examining decades of data on the topic of leadership specifically. They've studied more than 1 million work teams. Now think about that. How do you study 1 million work teams? Gallup is amazing at that. They've conducted more than 20,000 in-depth interviews with leaders and have even interviewed another 10 or 100,000 more followers to ask them why they followed the most important leaders. They've, They've done tens and tens of thousands of these over the course of time. There are so many amazing statistics about what make each one of these tests unique and comprehensive. The nature, the data, the science that's gone into this book, and the, the assessment that's a, a component of this book is really, really important. I'm going to save some of those amazing statistics for some future episodes where we'll bring on a strengths-based leadership trainer to help us understand some of the background. Now, I do want to explain that within the book, and even if you get the ebook version or audiobook version, you'll get a way to find your secret code. And this code will help you unlock an assessment test. In the book, it's at the back of the book, and you cut the uh, area open, and you go to the Gallup website that's uh, indicated on the, the code area, and then you enter your secret code. And then it takes you about 30 minutes to conduct your assessment. Now, I, sometimes I call it a test, but it's not a test. There's no pass-fail. This is an assessment to determine what your strengths are, what your natural strengths are part of your wiring. 
Now, Gallup calls them themes. And these themes are what they want you to focus on uh, developing and getting good at versus where we're commonly focused is on our weaknesses. And some of the stories that, that have been meaningful to me are, and this is actually how Gallup got into the, the business, uh, sometime long ago, uh, decades now, a school district hired uh, Gallup and, and the team to say, hey, we want to figure out why our students don't read as fast. We have some slow students. We want to help those slow students, the weaker students, read faster. So we want you to teach them about the speed reading or whatever the, the case was. And what they found, they, they applied this speed reading course or whatever the curriculum was. I don't remember the detail precisely. But they applied the, the remedy, and they did it across the whole student body. So this, the ones who were already good readers and the ones who were not so good readers. And what they found is that, yes, the, they were able to take the weak readers up to the average. And that was great. Mission accomplished. High five. Let's roll out the banners. But the more important discovery was those who were already strong at reading, who, who had that strength built into them, part of their wiring, they quintupled their performance in reading. So they didn't just stay at the average, they quintupled. So their, their improvement was so much more substantial than the, those that were not strong at reading. This got the, the scientists and the folks behind Gallup really diving into what does this mean and why would this happen? And it helped really create this whole philosophy that we should be focusing on strengths versus weaknesses. In school, it's a common process for all of us to go through, and we look down you know, our, our report card or our child's report card, and we go, hey, you got an A here, A here, B here, uh, you know, B here, but you got a D and an F here. And, of course, what's our advice? Focus on the D and the F. Let's get that going. And the reality is you know, we want to encourage ourselves, our kids, to achieve whatever uh, minimums are necessary to accomplish our goals. But th the real takeaway is where you're getting A's, where you really love to hang out, that's your areas of strength. And this assessment that's in this book will show you your areas of strength. And we're going to talk right after this sponsorship break about my, a few of my strengths. And I'm going to take you for a deep dive into those strengths and talk about why I think it's really interesting. So we're going to be right back after this. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals. This is Parsimony ERP, and we get one question over and over. Can you please tell me exactly what Parsimony does? Well, we'll try, but this is only a 30-second spot, so we're going to have to hurry. Connect to your Seller Central account and pull all the new orders. Enter the orders with all customer data. Enter all of the Amazon fees and charges. Store them at the item level. Generate profit and loss reports at the SKU level. Automatically generate income statements. Handle multiple companies. Handle multiple brands. Handle multiple currencies. Facilitate budgets and forecasts. Store all customer interactions in a sophisticated CRM system. Manage your supply chain. Project and task management. Maintain an audit log. Hey, you get it. That's parsimony. P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N-Y.com, com. We've got that. Okay, here we are. We're back again, and I want to just share with you that when you take this assessment, boy, when it comes out and you start reading the description, it can come out and feel kind of spooky. Uh, when, I, when I read not just the, the quick version, which I'm going to share some, some uh, bits of that with you today, but the more comprehensive version, which is custom-made for me. It's, it mixes my top five themes or strengths, and it overlays those, and it talks about how those manifest themselves or are likely to manifest themselves in my life and in my, my career. And I'm going to share some of those with you today. So uh, some of my top five strengths are responsibility, self-assurance, relator, ideation, and learner. Now, Gallup has taken the opportunity to make some of these words up, which is great. Uh, and, and then they define those words within the, the book itself. And I, I do want to back up a second. And for those who may not know, Gallup is a long-term statistical and data organization. They do presidential polls. They used to do, and probably still do to some level, uh, figuring out who's watching what on television. Before the Internet, they Gallup installed all these set-top boxes to figure out what people were watching and then did all the statistical analysis to determine – you know, what they were watching, why, when, and what that meant about, you know, the, the shows themselves and the people watching the shows, which told advertisers all about, you know, what they should be doing and where they should be advertising. So Gallup has a long, long history, and I, I would say a proud tradition. 
a very, very well-respected organization at collecting data and then figuring out what it means. So you may have heard me talk about my strengths, and I'm just going to break them into the different buckets that uh, each of my five themes fall into. So that first, there's the execution bucket uh, or executing, uh, which is the operational part of a business. And my responsibility strength falls directly in kind of that operational element of the, the running the business. And we'll talk about responsibility here in a bit as well. Uh, under influencing, this is you know how people around you are impacted. Uh, self-assurance is what falls in that bucket for me in, in my particular top five strengths. Now, the next bucket is called relationship building, and that's I'm a relator. So this is how I go about building relationships. And then the final bucket is strategic thinking, which includes my final two top five strengths, ideation and learner. So uh, the reason I, I point out these buckets is because on your teams, you want to make sure that you've got a broad range and that on your team, you have enough of these strengths in the appropriate buckets. And particularly when you have somebody who should be focused on operations, it's, it's mentally, it's a nice feeling when they have some of these strengths that show up in those buckets. But I'm going to, I'm going to explain and give you an example of why just because somebody is a great execution person doesn't mean they can't be great at sales or somebody who's great at relationships can't be great at finance. All strengths have the potential to be your foundation to do any job, to lead any company, and to accomplish whatever your objectives are. So let's talk a little bit about my first strength. And I'm, I'm going to you know, share it with you in detail just so you can get a sense of what it talks about. Now, if you got ideation, yours might be a little bit different than this, but this is the general thing that it told me about my ideation strength. It says, by nature, you bring new thoughts to most discussions and meetings. Your reputation for innovative thinking explains why you are recruited by groups. You derive satisfaction from mental activity. You recognize when you are especially creative. Driven by your talents, you ask questions. You ponder answers. You find the underlying causes of a situation, problem, system, mechanism, plan, regulation, or prohibition. Right? I always want to know what's, what's at the heart of something. Logical and ordered in your thinking, you study every detail, however small. You are determined to examine the facts. Because of your strengths, you customarily generate more concepts than anyone else on the team. I also, by the way, call those harebrained schemes. I don't call them concepts. I'm like, hey, I got a new harebrained scheme. Knowing this probably motivates you even more to be prepared for upcoming meetings, presentations, activities, conversations, or debates. You have a gift for capturing and holding people's attention. You probably describe your latest thoughts, innovations, solutions, theories or answers in ways that make sense to your group's members. We'll see. Maybe this podcast will uh, prove this thing wrong. Uh, as a result, you intentionally commit to memory complicated and intricate words as well as specialized terminology. You use language to your advantage in situations where you desire influence, conf you desire to influence, confront, make demands of, or issue orders to people. Your vocabulary allows you to speak with authority. It's very likely that you see yourself as an inventor of unusual and innovative things to do, or something like that. You grow weary and bored with activities when you're forced to perform them in a prescribed and traditional manner. Your frustration increases when you know there's a better method, but no one is willing to consider changes you suggest. Now, I read this entire thing just to give you a sense of what that ideation strength is. When I read that, yes, many of these things are just right there in my face. It's like, how do they know? When, when they do the assessment, it's remarkable the questions they ask you. They don't say, do you have a lot of ideas? Click yes, right? They don't say, are you able to capture and hold people's attention? Click yes. They ask you questions like, you know, do you like to drive a car? Or do you like to be a passenger in a car? You know, are you good at... Uh, you know, washing dishes or drying dishes. I'm giving some, some examples that may or may not be on the assessment. My point is the questions, there's no way you can outsmart this thing. And when you do the assessment, my best advice to you is that you just pick a side. So the it, it'll have, you know, kind of more likely or less likely on a scale. And if you go right in the middle, that's considered neutral. And it disregards the neutral answers. And if you a answer too many neutral answers then you're not going to get, I think, a very good reading. So 
whichever way you're inclined, whichever way your instincts, you know, more likely or less likely on whatever scale they give you, just click one and move on to the next question. You are timed and it will time out if you take too long on a particular thing. If you heard me read this and you said, hey, some of those things, um, you know, resonate with me, you may have ideation as part of your strengths. Let's look at another one. Uh, responsibility, and this is one of my, uh, I put strengths in quote here. Uh, it's not something I feel particularly strong. Uh, although all of these things are true, it doesn't feel like a strength. It feels like a burden, and I'll show you why in a minute. So I'm going to read this one out again and see if this sounds like you uh, or it could be part of your strengths as well. Driven by your talents, you stand out as notably mature. You are reasonable in your thinking. These two qualities usually distinguish you from many of your peers and friends. Instinctively, you are consistent in your core values and predictable in your actions. People are likely to know that you go to great length to do things right and behave in an ethical manner. It's very likely that you sometimes open yourself to diverse types of people. You ordinarily welcome individuals who would otherwise feel out of place or ignored. Because of your strengths, you volunteer for additional duties. Uh, hashtag this is where it gets ugly for me. You really enjoy being given authority over projects, individuals, or groups. You expect to be held accountable for the results you produce, as well as your words and deeds. By nature, you normally strive to do things right. Taking shortcuts strikes you as unprincipled, thoughtless, and careless. You likely refuse to produce sloppy work or engage in unethical practices. Now, this definitely is its a blessing and a curse, I'll tell you what, because part of having the responsibility as a strength is the reality that if, if I try to do the right thing and I try to get things done, but I tend to take on a little too much, the dark side of the strength, and we'll talk about uh, the dark side is actually not the official word. They call them barrier labels. The barrier label to this strength is that it's hard to say no. And the reality is if if I overcommit to something and doing too many things and then I fail on something, then I work double hard to make it up to somebody, whoever I'm I'm letting down. So it is really a strength that has to be managed. And we're going to talk about this concept of barrier labels and the idea that you know strengths are great if you develop them into a strength, but if you live on the dark side or uh, embrace the so-called barrier label, it can work against you. And we'll talk about some examples of that as well. So the final one, I won't read uh, too much of this, but it's called Relator. And I, I'm going to just give you some blurbs of this because I think this is you know, part of what I, I like to do. Besides hanging out with my kids, hanging out with entrepreneurs is my favorite thing to do. And... I definitely find people around me that I tend to stick with over long, long courses of time, decades in fact. And so I'm going to just read a little bit um, uh, here that it says, you really appreciate people who have a gift for beginning discussions or making small talk. I'm not sure I appreciate small talk, just to be clear. Uh, in fact, I'm not a fan of small talk, but I don't mind anybody who wants to break the ice. These individuals usually create a safe environment for you to express your feelings and idea, ideas. Driven by your talents, now you fill your mind with new ideas by asking questions, reading, studying, observing, or listening. Normally, you accumulate facts, data, stories, examples, or background information from people you meet. I love origin stories. That's a part of how this podcast became a thing. Awesome origin stories. When I hear them and I hear some of these inspiring stories, I'm like, man, oh, man, I wish it was more than just me who got to hear how cool that is and how awesomer they are. And so uh, when... Uh, the next line says, determining what they accomplish, what they want to accomplish in the coming weeks, months, or years satisf generally satisfies your curiosity. Like I really do enjoy learning about people and what their goals are and ideally being able to help with them. It's something that gives me satisfaction and fulfillment. Instinctively, you are, offer uh, you are comfortable offering suggestions to people who regularly seek your counsel, that is, recommendations about a decision or course of action they are considering. So this happens all the time in the Catalyst 88 Mastermind Group. Uh, the members there have you know, free reign to come to me basically any time. I, I answer as often as I can, weekends, nights, holidays, doesn't matter to me. When they have a, an issue and they need help, seek counsel. I want to help them. And again, it gives me great satisfaction that I'm able to step in and, and help some people out and, and maybe you know, lighten their burden just a little bit or at least share some of the, the stories that, that may impact their decision-making process in a positive way. 
Uh, it goes on to say, these individuals usually feel deep affection for you. You're likely to spend time socializing as well as working or studying. Chances are good you're probably quite willing to welcome all kinds of individuals, regardless of their appearance, education, social class, native language, religious preference, or political persuasion. This explains why your circles, circle of friends or acquaintances is so diverse and interesting. And I'll, I'll leave it there, but the point is I really do believe that you know people from anywhere who do anything for any reason – you know, all have some value, and I want to figure out what, you know, makes them special and what makes them awesomers. And, and to the extent they need help on their journey, I love to lend a hand. So my point is, instead of me writing this stuff down about myself, I would have never been able to articulate some of these things. But it truly does resonate. And when I read the reports the first time, I, I was flabbergasted. It's like, this is spooky. It's so on the money. Uh, now, I will tell you that sometimes people will take the assessment, you know, found in the back of the book, and they, they look at it, and they're like, I don't see this. I don't understand this. And I had a very good friend, and he saw empathy as one of his top strengths, and, and everybody around him could see it. It was so obvious that empathy was a big part of his strengths, but he could not see it. In fact, his, his wiring made him feel maybe empathy is a weakness, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, but the reality is we were able to help him. The people around him were able to help him see this strength within him. And it was, again, patently obvious to the rest of us. And after we explained it, you know, we kind of read through the strength. And, and inside the book, by the way, it, it will show you all 34 strengths. And it will show you different uh, definitions of each strength. And they're very, very uh, simple definitions. It's easy to understand. And within each one, it will talk about, you know, how to lead with that strength. Uh, it will also talk about how you lead others with that strength. So you, you should know yourself and you should know the people around you. The point is, if you read, you know, your assessment after you've uh, purchased the book and, and taken the assessment, and you don't see that it's resonating with you directly, just take a minute, give it a beat, and ask the people around you if they see it. Now, Again, as long as you've answered the, the questions accurately, I absolutely think it's going to have you nailed dead to rights. That's absolutely what I believe. All right, so let's talk about some different strengths. So I've, when I think about William Churchill, you know, what a great leader. Um, this is you know, somebody who is world famous. Uh, nobody should need to know who he is. If you, if you don't know by any chance, go, just go ahead and search uh, Winston Churchill on Google and get his background. But Churchill was an extraordinary leader, and when we when we think about it and hypothecate, his strength was probably command, right? Because uh, the command quick definition is people who are especially talented in in command have presence, right? And boy, did Winston Churchill have presence! They can take control of a situation and make decisions, right? Does that sound like Churchill? Obviously, he went into a, a state of chaos in you know, the beginning of World War II, and he, he just stood up there and said, hey, it, it ain't going to be easy, but we're going to get through it. He delivered some of the most famous speeches of all time that still resonate with people today, and it's very clear to see that that strength of command seemed to be quite obvious to, to me. Now, I've not run the assessment on Churchill, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say he has command as one of his top strengths. So our, our logical brain goes, okay, well, if I want a commander-in-chief or a uh, world leader, then they should have command, right? Because we see what a great example that command is. And this is, this is where the, the part of our mind, we're trying to always hack the system, right? So just imagine you're hiring for this position. I'm hiring for um, you know, the president or the prime minister or whoever, and you're, you're the hiring manager, and you see what a great success Churchill was, and he had the strength of command. Well, maybe all leaders that you're hiring should have command. That's the logical assumption. But I want to give you a counterpoint to that. And let's take a look at Gandhi, right? Mahatma Gandhi was an extraordinary leader, right? He changed the world. He changed India forever. And by the way, in some ways, uh, Churchill and, and Gandhi were adversaries. Uh, Churchill did not want India to leave the empire, and Gandhi fought uh, and I should put fought in quotes, right? He, he starved himself into uh, a making change and, and did really extraordinary things. But 
as you're listening to this, would you say that Gandhi has this, the strength of command? Not a chance in my view. I think that uh, his strength is more likely to be found in empathy. And the, the strength of empathy says people who are especially talented in the empathy theme can sense the feelings of other people by imagining themselves in others' lives or others' situations. I don't know if I pronounce others' is right. But the point is, Gandhi was clearly empathetic, right? He imagined all of the, the people around him. He could see how their lives and their situations uh, were impacting themselves, the country, and he wanted to do something about it. So here we have these two extraordinary leaders, both world-class leaders in every possible way, but they led completely differently. You know, the, I, I don't know that there's any uh, scale, you know, of command being here and empathy being over there, but my guess is they're the op opposite ends of the spectrum uh, from a philosophical standpoint, right? Command is like, hey, just do it. Uh, you know, I'm the boss, get it going and let, let's make it happen. And there's a time for it and a place for it, obviously. And empathy is like, hey, you know, let's figure this thing out together. Let's do what's best for everybody and let's make, you know, a positive difference in the world. Both extraordinary leaders. And this is the whole point. You, you just simply can't say that one strength is required for a particular position. So if you're hiring a marketing or a CEO, you can't just take one strength and get it in your head that it can apply, you know, that that particular strength, whatever their person's strength is, can't apply itself to whatever the position is. So let's talk about this concept of barrier labels. And uh, I'm just going to introduce you to the concept, then we'll dive into it after the break. So it's very clear that Churchill has command. I think that any uh, rational person would, would say he has command. And the barrier label, by the way, to command is bossy or dictator, right? And there's a pretty fair argument where people could go, you know, people who work with Churchill, I'm sure they would tell you he was bossy and dictatorial. In fact, many of his um, adversaries called him, you know, like a dictator. They, they were afraid of Churchill and him, you know, kind of over exerting his, his uh, dominance. So the, the point of a barrier label is, or as I like to call them, dark sides, is that to develop our strengths into their true full potential, we have to contain the barrier label. We have to eliminate or minimize that downside. And certainly all of us have to be cognizant of that. So let's take a look. At, you know, when we think about Gandhi, his strength being empathy, the, the barrier label there is bleeding heart. It's like, ah, you know, this guy's just a bleeding heart. You know, why should we listen? And so he, you have to be able to affect change by illustrating that, no, there's more to it than just, you know, this idea or this simple explanation. And that's what Gandhi was able to do. So we're going to dive a little bit more into barrier labels right after this break. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. Okay, we're back again, uh, everybody, on awesomers.com podcast, and we're talking about strengths-based leadership, and I w I've just introduced this concept uh, of barrier labels, and we're going to go into a little detail, a little more detail here, excuse me, and talk about some of the, the typical barrier labels that may exist. So we'll use the example of achiever. Now, achiever is the strength, and the description of that strength is something like people who are especially talented in achiever theme have a great deal of stamina and work hard. They take great satisfaction from being busy and productive. Now, achievers are people who they want to they want to make a difference on the and beat their own personal best, right? Whereas competitive is like I want to beat the other guy no matter the cost. So that you can have both achiever and co competition, by the way, both being different strengths. But achievers about you know doing your personal best. You're likely to make a lot of lists and, and things like that, to-do lists, and when you check them off, you get a high, you're like, oh, man, I'm getting so much done. So that's that's an achiever. Uh, now, a barrier label for an achiever is somebody that says work is more important than people. And you could see how you know somebody who's working really hard and trying to, to beat their personal best 
could have that perception amongst the people around them. So we have to contain and minimize that barrier label, uh, or as I like to say, the dark side. So analytical, let's just talk, take that as an example. Uh, people who are especially talented, oh yeah, excuse me. People who are especially talented in analytical themes search for reasons and causes. They have the ability to think about all the factors that might affect the situation, right? And so they're really, really good at looking at the data, digging in, and then they theorize about the causes, and then they try to prove it with data. Now, the dark side or barrier label is paralysis by analysis, right? Maybe these people have a hard time making decisions. And so as we think about the strengths, we want to have a variety of strengths on our team. We want to minimize the weaknesses. But one of the most important aspects of this is if we let the barrier label or the weak or the uh, the dark side run amok, the strength can actually be somewhat of a liability. Let's take a look at another batch of barrier labels. So a uh, learner, people who are especially talented in learner theme have a great desire to learn and want to continuously approve, improve, excuse me. In particular, the process of learning rather than the outcome excites them. Now I have learner, by the way, and I love to learn, right? And this is why I'm doing books of the week and why I'm always, you know, trying to do things that, you know, help me stay engaged. Now, the, the dark side of that is that curiosity may lead to irrelevance or non-productivity. And I assure you, more than one time, I've had some non-productivity, right? That was just going down that rabbit hole of, of learning. And I was excited by the process and it was great. But it's like, what did I get out of it? And that's, that's the point that I'm trying to get across to you guys is that you've got to manage not just the downside, but you've got to get something out of, you know, if you're investing in something. And in this particular uh, book and this particular philosophy, I think you can institute it as part of your company culture. And I've rolled this out to so many of my organizations, even companies that I was just uh, you know, on the board of directors or whatever. I generally will recommend this because it helps people get a common vocabulary. And what happens is when you get uh, the strengths for your colleagues and coworkers, they're able to come to me even and they say, hey, Steve, put your learner on ice for a minute. You know, just, just give it a second. We need to get some stuff done. We need to stop learning and maximize the result. I'm going to read the maximizer theme just very quickly or summarize it. Basically, maximizers tend to focus on strength as a way to stimulate personal growth and group excellence. They want to transform something strong into something superb, right? So they want to take something that's already strong and make it really, really great. Now, a restorative strength is taking something that's not so great and turning it into something great. And so, you know, maximizers are, uh, you know, the barrier label is picky, never satisfied. So when you get ideation and, and learners mixed with maximizers and focus type people, you, you get a little natural uh, conflict in there. But that's okay because you want both sides of the discussion and then maximizers are going to push you to make a decision and learners are going to push for new ideas. So that's why it's important within an organization to understand the strengths and to help people feed those strengths. It's really so important that instead of trying to beat somebody down, let's say they're in the uh, this uh, sales type of position and they are just not making enough sales and you realize, gosh, they're, they're all about focus and maximizing and kind of back-end analytical things instead of front-end relationships and influencing and other types of things. So you just find their individual strength. And again, the book is a great reference material. I'll tell you how to use it here in a minute. Um, it tells you how do you lead with each individual strength? How do you lead with responsibility? And it will also tell you when you're managed by somebody who has responsibility, how to deal with them. And I think this is a great example. Not only should you know yourself, but you should know the people around you, particularly if you work for somebody. Knowing their strengths and knowing how to interact with them will help everyone. And so ultimately, strengths-based leadership is about finding a common language and a way to kind of help coach each other. When I have uh, a buddy of mine has positivity and occasionally he'll check himself and go, maybe my positivity is running out of control here, but here's what I think. And then it'll give us all the chance to go, well, is he being a little too optimistic or, you know, as the barrier label says, naive, or is, is he on the right track? And, and again, all of these are strengths. You just have to develop into strengths. 
All right, so now that you you know have heard a little bit about this book, and I want to just share what I recommend your action steps should be. Uh, number one action step, buy the book. Do not read the book. I know that sounds weird. But once you have the book, take the survey, right? Take that assessment as quickly as you can. Get right after it. Be sure you set aside about 30 minutes. It's going to take you about a half an hour. And just focus. Kind of shut everything else out because this thing is timed and it's really important you just go with your guts. It's going to ask you innocuous questions that you have no chance of gaming. You really are not going to be able to game the system. So just go with your guts and answer it as honestly as you possibly can because you want the actual results. And the patterns of your answers, what you uh, answer, will culminate in you getting your own strengths report. Now, once you have that report, read the report. Notice I haven't said read the book yet. Read the report and kind of dig into it. Learn about those strengths a little bit and see if it resonates with you. I would love to hear some feedback uh, for those of you who buy and read this book and hear your experience. But I've talked to so many people. It's like, oh, my gosh, this thing is like in my head. I don't know how it knows this stuff. I didn't answer any questions that would tell it all of these things, yet somehow it knew. And I, I just like to reinforce here, this is not some nutty horoscope thing. This is science. This is real data and real behavioral patterns that are helping us accomplish this very important objective. Now, after you read the results, go ahead and check out the strengths in the book where you get a little bit more generic description about those strengths. And it'll talk about how you can lead with you know, various strengths, analytical and otherwise, um, how you, you know, build trust and show compassion and provide stability and create hope. And then most importantly, how you lead others that have focus as a strength, which I think is a, a really, I, I use focus as the, the example there. The, the point is knowing yourself and knowing those around you will help communication. It will help you interact as well. Finally, uh, read about, you know, managing the others in your organization. Read about their strengths once they, they go through this process as well, which again is in the book. I use the book largely for reference material. There is an introduction section in the beginning. It's not that long. Uh, it talks about how you build a team and, and the general philosophy of strengths based leadership. But it, it's you know it's probably less than a hundred pages. And so the the read is not that difficult. But I wouldn't start there. As I said, start with the assessment. And then finally, you have to consider whether or not you want to share this with your team. If you have a partner, I would definitely share it with your partner because partnerships are often tumultuous, right? You, know, you got into a partnership, but there's, there's friction, there's tension here or there. And often it's because strengths don't see each other as strengths. So, for example, I had somebody on my team, uh, and you saw my, some of my strengths, responsibility, learner, ideation, uh, relator, etc., Self-assurance. Uh, by the way, self-assurance, the Cliff Notes version of that is, uh, I think I'm right, and uh, even if I'm wrong, I still think I'm right, and most often I can convince other people I'm right. So uh, uh, hashtag be careful what you hear from me because I think I'm right, and I'll probably convince you that I'm right. Uh, but that said, I'm, I'm right. Uh, so the, the idea, though, is that when you're, when you're in a team environment, especially with a partnership, you will find these points of tension, and they – originate when you find yourself looking at another strength as a weakness. So in my case that I was referring to, I looked at, you know, harmony as like, how could that be a strength? You know, uh, one of my key people had harmony. And I'm like, that's not a strength. That was her number one, by the way. And I, you know, mentally, I, I'm often weak. And I said, you know, how can, how can harmony be a strength? That It just doesn't make sense to me. But when we look at harmony as a strength and we kind of dive into the details, we can see that, in fact, it is a strength. And let me just read it to you. People strong in harmony look for consensus. They don't enjoy conflict. Rather than they seek areas of agreement. And what it means is the way that she approaches things and solves problems is far different than the way I approach it. Uh, and I had to get over that mental hurdle of recognizing that strengths that don't resonate with me doesn't mean they're not strengths. And we use the Churchill Gandhi example, which is a good one, to show that you know it doesn't matter the strengths. Every strength has value. Every strength can lead an organization. Every strength can also work in any position. 
Although I admit my own weakness, and Gallup might call this uh, strengths malpractice, but uh, I'm not a certified guy, so I'll just go out on a limb. If if people are in sales positions, I like it when they're achievers and they have competition in their top strengths. That makes me feel good. Doesn't mean somebody with harmony and empathy can't sell like crazy. Uh, I'm not opposed to that idea. It just makes me feel good uh, because of the, uh, you know my weak mind, I suppose. So I, I just want to kind of summarize this book uh, for you one last time. Strengths-Based Leadership really pushes this philosophy that we focus on our strengths, that we do not waste our time on weakness, and that within our organization we should have a full complement, a, a nice round wheel of strengths throughout the team. Each individual doesn't have to be well-rounded, but the team should be well-rounded. And that's always an important core to strengths-based uh, philosophy and something, again, that I highly believe in and encourage people you know, to kind of learn your strengths. You can share the strengths with us in some of our online communities, and we can talk about them. And we will do more sessions about strengths-based leadership in the future. So this is an underlying philosophy, and there's a lot to it, how you develop yourself, how you develop your strengths, and how do you develop your organization and the culture of that organization. And so this is a very important, uh, you know, kind of foundational piece uh, to helping everybody out there kind of grow a business or develop a, a culture. Uh, and I, I'll leave a couple last little uh, free tidbits for you. Uh, organizations like Facebook are putting strengths, uh, the strengths uh, leadership or strengths finder into the process. So uh, Sheryl Sandberg talks about Facebook becoming a strengths-based organization. And they're able to retain people and recruit people significantly better than their competitors. And we'll probably share some of those statistics with you in the future. But they hold people better than Microsoft. And some guys will go, oh, Facebook, uh, maybe that feels cooler than Microsoft to, to people out there. Fine, they're beating Microsoft, you know, like 45 to 1 in terms of employee retention. The employees they get from Microsoft, they get 45 for every one they lose to Microsoft, something like that. And by the way, I may not have the number exactly right, but it's around there. Um, now, we look at another company like Apple and go, well, you know, Apple, that's a world-class company. There's no way it's going to lose to, to Facebook. Yet Facebook still has something like a 10 or 11 to 1 ratio of getting employees from Apple versus Apple getting them from Facebook. And it's credited largely to this idea of strengths-based leadership and strengths becoming part of Facebook as a culture. Uh, Amazon is also putting strengths into their organization. I happened to be at Amazon. We were at a meeting with the Catalyst 88 Mastermind. And we, on the back of our badges in the Catalyst 88 Mastermind, you know, on the front, obviously, it has our name. On the back, it has all of our strengths listed. So as a mastermind, we could talk about our strengths. And and challenge each other and say, you know, hey, you know, your your focus is, you know, too hyper focused right now. Think about the big picture and come over to my ideation land. It's friendly. It's nice. Anyway, when we were in the elevator, at one of the Amazon meetings we were having uh, some of the Amazon folks said, oh, we do strengths. And they started reciting some of their strengths and we compared notes. The, the point is the vocabulary was exciting. We all understood what the strengths have the potential to be. And we like that. And we, that, it gives us a very clear roadmap to how to uh, develop and address those strengths and within an organization how to make sure we have a full complement of strengths so that we're taking care of those four buckets that we talked about in the beginning like execution and uh, influence and relationships and so on and so forth. So it really – this is a very, very important work. I hope you take the time to buy the book, take the assessment, and then follow my instructions about – you know, how to uh, leverage the, the findings and, and start your process of learning. This is just the beginning, not the end. Empower. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empower is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Okay, everybody, that wraps another episode of the Awesomers.com podcast, and I hope you've enjoyed this uh, very deep look into one of my favorite uh, books, Strengths-Based Leadership. This is Awesomers.com podcast episode number 18, and all you have to do is go to Awesomers.com slash 18, 
like a super secret code, and you can find any show notes, details, and things like that. Uh, great part is those notes will continue to evolve over time as we add more details to that particular subject matter. So even if you see something today that's not uh, everything you wanted, don't hesitate to check back uh, over the course of time, and you'll see continued improvements to these pages. They're living documents after all. So again, we hope you enjoyed this particular episode. It's, some, it's a book I really believe in. I think for organizations, it has a high, high potential to make a positive impact on your business. And I really encourage you to take a serious look at it and not forget that you know, building a company, as I always like to say, requires strategy, systems, and scale. Scale really means people, right? You can't scale without people. And ultimately, having a good culture and having good people and having the focus on the right strengths is really what can help you leverage amazing, amazing things. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers Podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now is a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Osmers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again.